Jim, welcome back to Real Vision. It's always a pleasure and an honor to chat to you. Well, it is my pleasure. It is my honor. I am a fan. <laughs> Thank you. Listen, Jim, you're one of the people I love to reach out to when the world is getting pretty confusing. And I was trying to, you know, we're all trying to think through what's going on. We've got this kind of crazy market and everybody's scratching their head trying to think, okay, how does this play out from here? How are you kind of conceptualizing this right now? What are you thinking about the markets? Well, if you don't know what to do, you should watch a real vision. <laughs> they can tell you. <laughs> They, they can tell you what's I'm happening. Too busy. Oh, you're too busy? Well, uh, then I can get somebody to watch it for you. How is it all going to play out? Well, it seems to me that what's happening is because of the gigantic amounts of money being printed, you know, it takes a while to build a factory, but it takes 10 seconds to go online and, and invest. A lot of money is going into investment markets all over the world. And I don't see any reason for this to end. I, I see bubbles forming, uh, but I don't see bubble, full-fledged bubbles in the stock markets yet. You know, yeah, some stocks never go down. Tencent never goes down. Uh, Samsung never goes down. Apple never goes down. But there's still a lot of stocks that aren't up, so it's not a full-fledged bubble. It is a full-fledged bubble in bonds. Bonds have never been this expensive in the history of the world, at least the recorded history of the world. So bonds are definitely in a bubble. Property in some cities, Seoul is a gigantic bubble. Look around, there are cities where property is a bubble. Commodities, the only thing I know that aren't, that are still cheap uh, compared to other assets around the world uh, and some stock markets. I'm investing in China, I'm investing in Japan because the US is at an all time high but some markets are still down from their all-time high. So I want to unpack some of these things. So you said something interesting about companies like Tencent and Samsung. Do you think we've got a kind of secular trend change in how people value these kind of high-growth, you know, high-margin companies? Is there a change going on that we're having to get our heads around because the bond market basically is not a market anymore? Well, th this is, uh, you know, this is not my first rodeo, Raoul. I've seen this movie before. You know, many times people get very excited. I can remember in the late 60s, if it had computer in the name, the stock went through the roof, even if it was a laundry. Didn't matter, <laughs> you know, didn't matter what it was. I mean, I've, we've all seen this before. We're, we've seen it in Japan. We've seen it in America in the late uh, 90s. Uh, this has happened before and it's happening again. Whatever the hot technology is of the day, those stocks, for whatever reason, get very, very hot. 150 years ago, it was railroads. You know, there was a gigantic bubbles in railroads. And you know, Raul, railroads are still around, but you never made money in the stocks if you bought them in the bubble. You remember 1929? 1929, Radio Corporation of America, RCA, became unbelievably expensive. Well, we still have radio, like radio, you know, merged with CBS, et cetera, et cetera, it's still there, but you never made money if you bought it in the bubble. So be careful. You ask how it's gonna play out. We've had bubbles before, we're gonna have them again, and they always end badly. And if you buy the bubble stocks, you're probably never going to make money. Something that I've noticed this time around Sorry for interrupting your video, but I have a very important message to share. At Real Vision, we pride ourselves on providing the very best in-depth expert analysis available to help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy. So if you like what you see on the Real Vision YouTube channel, that's just the tip of the iceberg. You should come to realvision.com and see how we're not leaving any stone unturned from publishing more in-depth videos, live discussions, written reports, and our latest feature, The Exchange, where you get a chance to engage with experts, fellow subscribers, and learn from everyone's experience, which can't be wrapped in a video. It's an experience which you live and learn from. So if you go to the link in the description or go to realvision.com, it costs you just $1. I don't think it's something you could afford to be without. And I have them again, and they always end badly, and if you buy 
the bubble stocks, you're probably never going to make money. Something that I've noticed this time around, I mean, I'm noticing this bubble behavior build up. And we've seen, you know, retail speculative activity, the option activity. It's probably less so in Asia, but it's very predominant in the US. We're seeing mutual funds with record low cash holdings. And we're seeing record margin debt, all of the kind of big marker stones. They're not great for timing, but they they start to stack up. It feels that somewhere maybe in the next 12 months or even sh- shorter, we run the risk of a sort of 1987 event. By that, I mean a non-economic event, but a market-based event because everybody's over their ski tips. Well, any thoughts on that? I was speaking to F- Felix Zulaf about this as well last week, and Felix had the same kind of view on this, that it feels like it's heading that way. Well, it certainly does. You see a lot of new investors piling in, talking about how easy it is to make money, how much fun it is to make money. Gosh, I wish it were easy. Um, SPACs, you see SPACs coming in. SPACs often come in at the end of big, long bull markets. You know, remember the Mississippi Land Company? I mean, the South Sea Land Company, that was 300 years ago. Same thing. They invented SPACs long ago. So all this has happened before, and it is happening again. Now, your question and mine and everybody's, when is it going to end? I don't see it ending yet, um, but something may well happen. W- one thing that always happens is it just gets so expensive that it ends, or a central bank or two starts cutting back, or war breaks out, or something happens, and various and sundry things, but I don't see any of those things happening. Yeah, if everybody were buying stocks, you know, when you go to the dentist, Raul, if the receptionist wants to talk to you about stocks, that's a bad sign. That's a very (laughs) bad sign. Um, Those sorts of things are beginning to happen. I went to my chiropractor the other day and the massage lady wanted to talk about stocks. Well, it wasn't the receptionist yet, but it's starting to happen. (laughs) So, here, you know, you've got a lot of great stories. I'd love you to tell the story of 1987, how it affected you, your observations at the time, and how you dealt with that. Because I just think experience is really important for people. Whether that event happens again or not is irrelevant, but I, I think it's really great for people to share some of the experience that you learned. Well, I, I'm I'm delighted to talk about that with one of that. I've had a, a few winners in my life. That happened to be one. I don't know if you know, but I was short the U.S. market, and it all happened on my birthday. The best <laughs> birthday, oh, the best birthday, October 19th, was my birthday. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I'll Still never forget that believe. now, Jim, because I know that yeah, date. I won't either. <laughs> I won't, I, a, I don't forget my birthday, but B, I don't forget October 19th, 1987. You know, I'd been babbling on and on and on about how this was all crazy and out of control and that Greenspan didn't know what he was doing. And then it started happening. It started about six weeks before. Uh, I mean, how did I know that the thing started coming apart six weeks before October 19? But then it did. You had all the things, people buying on margins, speculating. It was very easy. Stocks went straight up for nine months or something. That route, you've been around, you know, these things have happened before. And what tipped it that time? Because that was a weird one, because the central bank didn't raise rates. I mean, bond yields were going up and the dollar was bouncing after falling sharply and, you know, those kind of things. Any idea what tipped it or was it just the crowd? It just changed. Well, there was portfolio insurance in those days. There were all sorts of new, wonderful inventions to make sure stocks never went down or that nobody ever <laughs> lost money again. Um I don't remember a specific trigger. I do remember that it started like August 25th because I was having dinner with a friend of mine, was the head of the Wall Street Journal at the time, and we were talking about it. And I was telling him, blah, blah, blah. And lo and behold, that was the day. He still remembers. I still remember. But I don't remember anything specific happening uh, that, that caused it, just that it got too overheated. You don't have to have a specific ringing of the bell or shooting of the pistol, but it can happen that way. So let's flip a bit to the bond market where you said there is a huge bubble that's been built. How does that end and why does it end? Because the central banks won't let it end, um, essentially. 
We've seen it in Japan. They can buy unlimited amounts of bonds. I mean, how, how does this stop? And they are buying them. And the head of the central bank says, his word is, we will print unlimited, that's his word, unlimited amounts of money and put it in the investment market. And he's doing it. Raul, he buys ETFs every day. Well, I own Japanese ETFs. He's got more money than I do. If he's going to buy ETFs, I am too. And, and you know, the Japanese market is still down 35% from its all-time high. The U.S. market is making all-time highs. There's a chance, I mean, I don't know, you watch Real Vision, they'll tell you, but there's a chance that the Japanese market may go back to its all-time high of over 30 years ago because of all the craziness that's going on in Japan and in the world. Uh, I do not know what the trigger will be. Um, I, I, you, I can feel what's happening. I see all the signs. We've talked about some of the signs. But it's not as though there's total madness yet. As I said, there are a lot of stocks that are still down or still aren't participating. Now, in the bond market, everything is participating. Junk bonds, foreign bonds, everything. So unless you have a special situation bond, I would not own bonds anywhere in the world. I do own, full disclosure, I do own some Russian government bonds in rubles, but they're short term. I mean, they're a year or two. When you're allocating risk now, what are you looking for? You've, you've talked about Japan a bit, and I understand, you, A, you've got the central bank on your side, and B, it's a discounted market and it's not wildly expensive. Well, what, what else is interesting to you right now? Um, where you're more comfortable taking risk? Well, I will be buying agriculture. In fact, I have orders in at the moment to buy more agriculture because agriculture is still, very, as I said, commodities are the only thing that I know that are still cheap. Uh, you know, silver's down very, it's down 45% from its all time high. Uh, sugar's down 75 or 80% from its all time high. Some of this stuff is still very cheap. Fundamentals are improving. Uh, Russia, everybody hates Russia. I'm buying Russian stock as we speak, uh, but I don't want to buy Apple. Now, if you know what you're doing, there are guys who are going to make a fortune in Apple this year, not me, <laughs> not on the long side, maybe the short side later this year. But no, I, that's not the kind of thing that I'm any good at investing in. So when you're trading the agricultural commodities, are you trading the futures contracts or are you trading equities that have exposure to them or a bit of both? Mainly I'm buying uh, the ETFs because uh, ETFs are a miracle. For lazy people like me, they're great. But Raul, I'm sure you've seen all the studies. The studies show that if you invest in the index, you're going to outperform most investors, professional and otherwise. So for me, I'm buying the agricultural index. ETF, ETF to be exact. What about gold and silver? You mentioned silver. They've had a kind of slightly ugly year. They've been, you know, gold has been chopping lower for, you know, six months or so and can't really get its traction. What do you think gets that market going again? And the mine, the miners as well, which are very cheap, have been struggling. Well, I have not been buying and, and probably will not buy. I'm waiting for the correction to work its way out. I, listen, my market timing is horrible. I'm the worst market timer in the world, Raul, so don't, don't listen to me for short-term trading. But somewhere along the line, I hope that I'm smart enough to buy more silver and more gold, probably more silver than gold because silver is down 45%. Gold is only down 10% from its highs. So no, before this is over, Raul, both of them are going to go through the roof because whenever, I mean, history shows that whenever people lose confidence in governments and money, all of us peasants buy gold and silver. I'm, listen, the politicians and the academics of South, forget gold. It's, it's a barbarous relic or whatever the term. That, but Raul, peasants like me like to have some gold in the closet. We like to have some silver under the bed. Because we also old peasants know, okay, maybe it's not any good, but we want some. But I'm not buying it now. I mean, I own a lot, but I'm not buying now. And have you ever caught the Bitcoin bug? Have you got an interest in that yet? I mean, a lot of people have started to get very interested. I mean, I've been very involved in it for a long time now. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I obviously wish I had bought Bitcoin. Um, <laughs> however, I will point out that many 
cryptocurrencies have already disappeared and gone to zero. We all hear about Bitcoin. We don't hear about the dozens that don't exist anymore. There's no question that money is going to be on the computer. Uh, you cannot take a taxi in China with money. You cannot buy ice cream in China with money. You got to put it on your on your phone. Um, so some countries, every country is working on it, including the U.S. Chinese are ahead. But Rao, my view is it's going to be their money if. Let's use Bitcoin. If Bitcoin ever becomes a viable currency, not a trading vehicle, but a viable currency, they're going to outlaw it. Governments don't want to lose control. They, don't, they like their monopoly. And once they all have their own government money, you think they're going to say, OK, here are US dollars and they're on the computer. But if you want to use something else, you can. <laughs> That's not my experience with governments any time in history, or, well, most times in history. And I can't imagine the U.S. government's going to let people do that. No, I mean, a lot of people now try not to think of Bitcoin as like a replacement to currencies, but more as a store of value like gold plays, but in the digital world. So in which case, you know, the authorities, yes, occasionally they ban gold here and there. But generally speaking, they kind of allow it to exist alongside um, saying, okay, if you want to store a value, that's okay. Just don't let it become money. Well, as I said, if it's just a trading vehicle, I don't see any reason that they would outlaw it unless it's money laundering or something like that. Uh, no, if people aren't trying to use it to compete with government money, why not? I, I, I know I'm not a very good trader, so I can't imagine that I would ever try to buy and sell it. But there are plenty of guys who are very good at it who are doing it. But as a store of value, I don't, well, yeah, conceivably, but I don't know what the value is. It doesn't, there's no, listen, if we have a store of value of silver, I know that silver will, can be used in solar panels and electric cars, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know what Bitcoin can be used as except for a trading bit. One of the things that I'm looking at is the underperformance of emerging markets versus developed markets particularly versus the US, right? It's all-time underperformance. So when we talk about cheap, some of these markets are, are really, really cheap in comparison. They're not super cheap in price terms, but generally very cheap in comparison. How are you thinking about emerging markets? It's got to be on your radar screen. I mean, you're a big emerging market fan, and you obviously allocated some ca cash to Russia, but what are you looking at in that? Do you think there's a big opportunity setting up? Oh, I know there are huge opportunities. I mentioned Russia, which I, most people consider an emerging market. China, I'm buying Chinese shares. Japan's not an emerging market. No. It, it will be again someday, uh, but not now. Uh, those are a couple that I have on my list. Uh, I, I, oh, I'd like to be buying Myanmar, but you cannot do it now. You have to go there, which is not, I'm not interested in going to Myanmar at the moment. Uh, I'm looking, but I don't have anything other than maybe Russia and China that I'm buying at the moment. Have you, we talked, last time we talked, we chatted a bit about India and you were like, no, you know, you've been, everyone gets burnt in India because it's full of promises and no answers. How are you thinking that one through? Because I mean, it just still keeps going up. I mean, that's the, uh, regardless of all of the government and the bureaucracy and all the other terrible things that go on. Well, it's at an all-time high, yes. It, I mean, I, I again, back to my earlier statements, I'm not particularly interested in rushing out. You know, you want me to tell you things I bought 20 years ago? Well, I don't want to waste your time and you don't want to hear it. Uh, <laughs> but you want to hear what I'm buying tomorrow. You want to buy what you want to know what I'm buying next week. Uh, India's not on the list at the moment, but if you drive it down 50%, it'll be on the list again. Now, you, you're in a unique situation being in Singapore. The world is very kind of Western news centric right now. What do you feel the mood is on the ground in Asia? How, does it, how, how are people in Asia thinking through? Because they generally had a very good COVID. You know, they managed it well. Um, economic growth is returning faster than elsewhere. Um, there's a lot going on in the region. What, what, what's the sense on the ground there? And what people are thinking? Well, one of the main things that I sent and, and uh, is happening is, you know, the, the America, Donald Trump pulled out of Asia. He pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, and everybody, China said, oh, wait a minute, that leaves Asia for us. 
And then a month or two ago, there was another 15 nation trading partnership without the US, uh, including a lot of our allies like uh, Japan, Australia, places like that. So they're moving on here. Uh, America, I hope somebody in Washington is now saying, wait a minute, we better do something. You know, they're moving on without us. Um, and But the sense I have here is that that's exactly what's happening. Asia's saying, okay, see you. We're going to move on. We want to have, we want to trade. We know there's a lot of money here, a lot of trade here, a lot of energy here. And they're moving on. I mean, the U.S. in the in I don't want to overstate this, but many people are realizing not that the U.S. is irrelevant, but that we can get along without the U.S. if we have to. And they're doing it. They're moving on. I even sense in Korea right now that, you know, they would like to do something about North Korea. They haven't been able to because of the U.S., but I get a strong sense. These guys are now saying, well, maybe we should do something on our own. It feels that the world is kind of splitting, that an Asian bloc is forming, as you say. And they see everyone seems quite comfortable with it. You know, one of the issues for everybody is inter-Asian trade was always in US dollars, which is crazy. They say that too. And the Chinese digital currencies are the start of, the, of a big change, I think. I noticed in the last uh, few weeks or days that Angela Merkel is saying to herself more and more, you got to be nice to the Chinese, you know, Mr. Trump smash the Chinese, but we, wait a minute, wait a minute, we we should be doing business with the Chinese. Even, you know, the guy, the prime minister in, in England today said, I love China. I'm very, very keen on China because he's starting to get the, the pushback among companies in in England. That, wait a minute, what are you doing? It's the largest, the second largest economy in the world, you know, huge credit nation, et cetera. Uh, I'm beginning to sense that other people are starting to say, Mr. Trump can bash him all he wants. The Democrats can bash him all they want. But we know where our bread could be buttered. Yeah, it feels to me, I, I get interested when the narrative is all one way. And the narrative, particularly in the U.S., is extremely China negative. You know, and it's from both sides, you know, both sides of the political spectrum. And that often feels to me like an opportunity when the narrative has gone too far one way. I mean, you see that the continued growth in China, the continued rise in you know what's going on, the technology, the amount of money pouring in from the government and even from foreign capital. It feels that people are going to get politics confused with markets. Well, throughout history, when a country has problems, the politicians blame foreigners. And that's what Trump was doing. He was saying, ah, those evil yellow people with black eyes and black hair, and they speak a funny language and funny food and funny clothes. Yeah, that's what foreign, but politicians always do, Raul. Go back and read history. All, not just America, everybody. All politicians throughout history blame foreigners when they have a problem and they try. It's easy to blame foreigners for many reasons, and that's what Trump was doing, and he certainly raised the rhetoric and the Democrats joined in. I, I sense that the Democrats at the moment anywhere are saying, wait a minute, guys, let's, let's, let's start over, or let's think about this for a while, but certainly other countries in the world, I get a strong sense of starting to say, well, maybe, maybe we can figure out a way to do something about this. Um, one reason I'm interested in buying Chinese shares, they are below, uh, U.S. below most other stock markets, and certainly on a historic basis. And they don't have, they certainly seem to have handled the virus much better than most, most countries did. If you, I mean, I, I don't believe any government, but I see on the internet, I see what's happening in, in, in the streets and in the restaurants and the people. I see they're going to dance halls and gym classes and everything else. So, the Asians seem to have done a less bad job, especially China. And the rhetoric, I mean, this kind of crazy rhetoric has happened throughout history. And sometimes it has led to war, shooting war, not just trade war. Let's hope it doesn't happen again. But I'm investing in China. Yeah, I mean, you know, you were actually a huge influence on me when I read uh, Investment Biker for the first time 
And I just started out in investment banking in the early 90s. And it made me realize, and I think you really got people to think about this, is that what you hear is not necessarily the truth. What you see when you go there, speak to people, that's more cl- closer to the There is no truth in financial markets or economies, but it's closer to the truth. And, and that, I think, I, that was a huge lesson I learned from you. Well, it's a huge lesson I taught myself. I learned from me too by going. First time I went to China in 1984, I was just assumed I was going to get shot. American propaganda all my life had said they're evil, vicious, bloodthirsty, dangerous, poor, disgusting people. Didn't take me long to see from the ground up. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, there's another story here. But I, I have learned that many times, uh, Raul, in my life. You better see it for yourself. And certainly don't believe propaganda. Don't believe Chinese propaganda, American propaganda. Anybody, don't believe anybody's propaganda. Check for yourself. Yeah, and that's why Russia periodically becomes so cheap, because Westerners shun it. And, you know, it's kind of once every 10 years, Russia becomes just a phenomenal trade. And I I guess you sense that with commodities kind of starting to go up in price, Russia pretty much shunned by foreign investors. I I don't speak to anybody who's got anything in Russia right now. And there's other times when everybody's investing in Russia. Nobody's got anything right now. Is that your, your kind of sense as well? I have Russia, I know. <laughs> I mean, buy, and I'm buying more. Um, you know, they've got agriculture, they've got oil, uh, all, both of which have been disasters for a while. Um, and as you know, everybody hated Russia, still do, still hates Russia. But, and I hated Russia for many decades, but in the last four or five years, I think I've seen a change in the Kremlin for whatever reason. And they understand investing. They understand capital. They understand entrepreneurship now. Uh, I mean, this is not Switzerland. This is not the Netherlands. But it is. It seems to be a chain. And my goodness, it's cheap. Well, they don't have gigantic. Nobody would lend money to the Russians. And so they don't have gigantic debts like the U.S. or Japan or the U.K. or other people. Uh, what about in the currency world? Anything interesting? Or are you just thinking, well, the dollar probably slowly falls? I mean, how are you? Anything particularly interesting? I don't personally. I don't find a lot interesting in the currency world, but I don't know if you are seeing anything. My view is that there's going to be turmoil sometime in the next year or two, big turmoil, uh, for reasons we discussed earlier. And when I, whenever that happens, people look for a safe haven. And for historic reasons, many people still think the U.S. dollar is a safe haven. It's not. America is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, right? But people don't think that way. They certainly see problems in the UK and Europe, et cetera. They're not going to buy the Russian ruble. The Chinese, remember, they cannot buy it because it's not convertible yet. Uh, so I own a lot of US dollars on the assumption that in the next turmoil, it's going to get very overpriced. It could turn into a bubble as well. But at that point, I'm going to have to sell it. Uh, many countries, well, for economic reasons, it's the largest debtor nation in world history, but also for political reasons. You know, if Washington gets angry at you, they cut you, I put saying, they cut you off. Well, people are starting to say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not what an, an international currency is supposed to be. It's supposed to be neutral. You know, it's supposed to be usable anywhere. So now they're looking for a competitor. They're working on competitors, India, China, Brazil, Russia, various countries are working on competing currencies to compete with the US dollar. And I suspect it will happen. The one place that nobody talks about bizarrely is Europe. Everyone's just kind of given up entirely. Have you given up entirely as well? I mean, again, I I have, I don't really even bother to follow it. It's interesting, they're going to a digital currency and stuff, but Europe, I don't know. What do you think? Well, no, it's a, as you said those words, uh, I said, well, she's right. Many of those markets are up, of course, because they follow the US, the US market. And the euro as a currency, to me, is not wildly exciting for the reasons we all understand. I suspect there are going to be more separatist movements since the British pulled it off. Some There are politicians in other countries now saying, you know, I could make my name by being in favor of separatism, and they're starting to do it. So I would expect to see more turmoil of that sort 
in Europe. Um, but as you said those words, I own a few shares in Europe, but I'm not, no, I'm not buying anything. I don't, I, I guess, because I'm not looking. No, nobody is. I mean, we're kind of all, we've just ignored a third of the world's economy. I have noticed that Mrs. Merkel is starting to be nicer about the Chinese. I noticed, you know, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson is starting to be nicer about the Chinese. These things I noticed because I'm in Asia. And those are only recently that is starting to happen. But that, again, is Chinese-centric or Russian-centric. That's what's attracting my attention because they're starting, starting to talk about changing their views towards the East. Um, one of the things that obviously endlessly comes up, and you'll have heard it a thousand times before, is Taiwan and the risk of something, you know, a conflict there. Well, do you see that risk as rising? just the same as it ever was, just the rhetoric keeps going up and down. How do you how do you get to grips with that? I see the rhetoric rising, especially when Trump was there, you know, and they were doing everything they could to bash China. Uh, that rhetoric, I ha have the sense, is calming down now. But again, all these passions and views have been inflamed in the last two or three years. So I just want to um, go back to uh, commodity markets. So, you know, you've been, you know, very actively involved in commodities over the various cycles. Do you think, is this a, a kind of reflation idea? It's two to three years, we get some, we can make some good returns out of it. Or are we seeing something bigger? I mean, obviously, I remember when you, you wrote the book about commodities, that was China coming in. So there was a huge demand shift to the world. And, and you know, you were dead right in that. It doesn't feel like we've got a demand shock here. So it feels like it's more, you know, a cyclical commodity play. What, what are your thoughts? I'm starting to see a lot of people talking about a, a new super cycle in commodities. I wish I, I wish they weren't saying that, you know, because when we get a lot of people bullish, it worries me. I don't like that. Uh, I wish they would still say, oh, it's crazy. I do know that on the supply side, there are many problems, partly because of the, of the virus. And I do know there are some demand shifts. They, you know, we're all going to have electric cars, apparently. Well, electric cars use five times as much copper as regular cars. You know, some of the stuff like zinc and lead, they need it. Silver, they for solar panels, for, for electric energy, you need a lot of these things. So there are demand shifts taking place. Nothing like the, the coming in of China 20 years ago, but these things are, there are things happening and the supply side is down because of the virus and the problems it has caused. So I'm bullish, I'm, I'm long commodities. I, Hope I'm buying some more yesterday. I don't know. I'll have to see um, what's happening. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm certainly not selling. There is also the upside chance that these fiscal stimulus that are still to come, not the ones to get rid of cash flow problems over the virus, but the infrastructure projects that both the EU and the US have talked about. And they're generally going to be green infrastructure projects, I'm guessing. That could be a demand shift that nobody's really factoring in yet, particularly in some of these commodities that, you know, it's not iron ore this time around, as you said. It's silver and copper and other stuff, lithium. Yeah, it's the things that people use for electricity. I mean, it, electricity's been around a while. We're not reinventing the world here. We're using, using it in more and more demand intensive ways, or so it seems. Uh, yeah, no, I see it, but I also see the thing. I mean, oil is down a gigantic amount um, for various and sundry good reasons. But that too, I mean, if you ask me, oil is making a, a complicated bottom. The fractures came in, huge bubble, but now that bubble popped. Everybody, it used to be, well, if you could spell fracking, people would give you money. It would give you all the money you wanted. But now they realize, oh my God, you got to make money, got to pay your bills. So the fracking bubble bursts. They're still fracking, going to be, but it's not uh, such a huge new source of supply as we had before. And in the meantime, known reserves of oil continue to decline. I mean, these are simple, straightforward facts. I'm not talking some miracle here. 
So oil is cheap, hydrocarbons are cheap, it seems. So maybe, anyway, commodities are certainly the cheapest asset class I see right now. And final question, silver, which you've mentioned a couple of times. I know a lot of people are interested in silver. We talked about ETFs, you know, just getting exposure to the metal itself or owning physical metal yourself. Do you look at silver miners as well? Is that something that kind of interests you or do you just keep it simple? I'm lazier than I used to be. Uh, if you have, uh, I've always been very lazy, but if you have a silver miner, send me an email and I'll look at the name and gold miners. But again, you know, Mark Twain, who was a great American writer, as you know, once said, the definition of a gold mine is a hole in the ground with a liar standing at the top. Uh, there are hundreds of silver and gold miners in the world. There's only one of these. So, so it's simple. Keep it simple, stupid. Yes, it's simple, easy to buy the, the ETF or the stuff the real stuff. But if you know, Raul, if you know a silver miner that's going to find a big deposit in Berlin, you should buy all you want and send me an email. <laughs> I want to buy it too. You'll make a fortune. You know, but unfortunately, there are hundreds of those out there. And you don't know who's telling the truth. Uh, yes, I'm keen. I'm keen. I'm keen. Certainly on silver and gold, better silver, but I, I don't have any I don't have any silver mines at the moment in my portfolio. Jim, look, as ever, a real pleasure to speak to you, to pick your mind, to get your perspective of what's going on. I really appreciate your time and uh, brilliant to catch up. Well, I am still a big fan of what you guys are doing. I, I hope you keep it up. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. It's remarkable what you have done and are doing. And I hope, I hope you continue. Thank you so much, Jim. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis, visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.